Hello everyone and welcome to an introduction to identifying bumblebees. Get Cumbria Buzzing is an innovative and ambitious 1.6 million year project funded by National Lottery and Highways England and a range of other funders. Our partners include the 10 that you can see below. Together and with your help, we aim to help to reverse the decline of pollinators across northwest Cumbria. In the news, more than ever, we're hearing really shocking statistics about insects and pollinators. More than half of UK bee, butterfly, moth and species have declined over the past 50 years. And over the last 75 years, we've lost 97% of our flower rich meadows. Now more than ever, insects and insect pollinators need our help. But it's not all bad news, there is some good news in the form of the small blue butterfly. We're working with butterfly conservation who have worked hard to put in habitat that is suitable for the small blue because their larva only feeds on caterpillar, only feeds on kidney fetch. So kidney fetch has been planted on the coast so this is a real good news story about the, the small blue and in fact Cumbria is one of the last strongholds of the small blue in northern England. Our project Get Cumbria Buzzing aims to increase the number and diversity of pollinating insect species especially in the light of how insects are declining at the moment. We aim to work with communities along Cumbria's west coast which includes schools, going to schools to plant wildflowers in their school grounds and also delivering gardening workshops to increase people's awareness about pollinator friendly gardening and also teaching people how to ID bumblebees and pollinators such as this presentation. And we're also taking an innovative approach to managing verges. We've already used a range of techniques in managing verges for pollinator friendly habitat. And finally, we aim to work with Cumbria Biodiversity Data Centre to develop an online pollinator atlas. This is extremely exciting because we'd be able to, with your help, get data for local and national databases, which will be able to track the movements of pollinators across Cumbria so we know better how to support them. We're also planning 115 hectares of pollinator friendly restoration work. If you follow my cursor to where the blue is shaded, you'll see this blue shaded area that goes right across the coast and right across the A66. This is habitat mapped by bee light, by bug life called, these are called bee lines, that if with suitable uh, pollinator friendly habitat, we would be able to create stepping stones or roads for pollinators to travel along. Altogether, we're restoring 115 hectares of pollinator friendly habitat on Highways England Strategic Road Network, which are these squiggly blue lines. This is where we're planting pollinators along the A66 from Penrith to Workington and along the A595 as well. And we're also planting for pollinators in these red areas. These are our community sites, which goes right across the, the northwest coast. And up here, you'll see a star. This is where we have created a wildflower nursery for growing wildflowers from seed. So far, we've grown over 5,000 plugs, and these will go into our sites all along the coast. But why care about pollinators? Pollinators provide one third of the food we eat. We'd have a lot less veg, a lot less fruit, and food life would be a lot more boring. Even chocolate, without pollinators, we wouldn't have chocolate. There is only one group of pollinators which pollinate the chocolate plant and these are called biting midges so about biting mid midges we'd have no chocolate also 80 percent of our flowering plants are pollinated by pollinators so we'd be in a lot less colorful world we'll have less flowers less shrubs and less trees and also 
pollinators like voluntary bees are the workhorses of our fruit orchards. They enable our, our fruit trees to grow and thrive. What is a pollinator? This As conference bee, will now be recorded. The bee carries pollen and then goes to the next flower and the pollen falls off the, the, the insect onto the flower, pollinating the flower. And pollen itself is really interesting. This is what pollen looks like under a microscope. It's been magnified times 500. So you can see all the beautiful different shapes of pollen from sunflower to morning glory to lily to primrose. In fact, the forget-me-not is the smallest pollen. It has not, it, it's not 0 0.006 millimeters, which is pretty amazing. Pollen grains are actually sperm cells that have a coat of spore pollen, which protects cells when being moved from the stamen to the female part of the plant. And these are often found in the fossil record, so you can tell about past climates and changes in vegetation just from the pollen. We've not seen the, the magnification Lucy. of the pollen yeah. here. Yeah. Lucy, the, the, uh, the screen's stuck. Yeah, so you might need to refresh. It's stuck. Yeah, just try and um, see if you can move the slide on. Yeah, we've got the pollen now. Got the pollen now. But okay, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, I can't see any photographs at all, only you. The uh, Tanya, screen. Would you be able yes, yeah, so that, that, can everyone else see Lucy's slide and Lucy? Yes. 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 Okay, right. Yes. 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 Thank you. Is it just me then? Yeah, if you no, um, I can't right, see okay. the slide. Right, let's go into chat and then we won't disturb the um, the, the talk. The talk isn't happening. So let us meet the pollinators. There are four different groups of pollinators that are really important. First off are the hymenoptera. These have this name literally means membrane wings because all the insects in it have membranous wings. So you get the sawfly, you get the bee, you get the wasp, and you get flying ants in this group. Bees are the most bees are the most efficient pollinators because of the amount of hairs they have on their body. And even bumblebees have special collecting sacs on their their legs, which call pollen sacs. Wasps are actually an important pollinator as well. We might uh, stigmatize them a little bit, but they, they are important pollinators, especially of uh, fruiting crops. Next up, we have the diptera, which literally means two wings. That's because they have only one pair of wings, whereas the hymenoptera have four, two, two pairs of wings, four wings in total. So that's how you can tell those two groups apart. On the right hand side, you can see a common house fly. On the left hand side, you can see a, a hover fly. And if you notice, it looks a little bit like a bee or wasp. So that's it doing a bit of mimicry, baits and mimicry. So it wants to look like a bee or a wasp, so it looks less palatable to predators. Because the predator thinks that it might sting it. Hoverflies. Hoverflies are actually one of our most efficient pollinators after bees, so they are really, really incredibly important uh, pollinators. Uh, well, next up we have next up we have Lepidoptera. So this comprises of butterflies and moths, and Lepidoptera literally translates to scale wings. That's because they have tiny little scales on their wings. Uh, butterflies are- I'm very sorry, but I still can't see any of these slides. 
Uh, if you talk to Tanya in the chat, she'll help you out. Okay. Yeah, go into chat. I'll I'll um I'll help you there. Oh. Let's have a look. Can you press on it? Hmm? So butterflies no. aren't as efficient pollinators as bees, but they You're can not the travel. only one who can't see the slides, neither can I. Ah. Some of us can. We can see the slides. If you get in a full screen of the person speaking, it may be you need to tick, uh, click on that and that will put her into a small box. I can't see the slides and I've been on chat and no one's replying to me. I can see the slides fine. Yeah, I can see them fine as well. I can see them. I can see the slides. I can see the slides perfectly well. Okay, so... Um, Butterflies can travel further distances than bees because they're not restricted by a nest. I'm just going to mute everyone just to reduce the noise disturbance. And moths are really important pollinators at night time. But of course, you do get day flying moths, which you might know. So they do pollinate in the daytime as well. The last group of pollinators we have are the coleoptera, the beetles. Coleoptera literally means sheaf winged. That's because their forewings cover their wings or uh, a version of their wing. And beetles are actually thought to be one of the oldest pollinators, pollinating up to 60 million years ago. Apologies, the other oh, So in the UK, we have a huge diversity of bees. When it comes to honeybees, we have one species of honeybees. When it comes to bumblebees, we have 24 species of bumblebees. When it comes to solitary bees, we have 250 species of solitary bees. So as you can see, we have a huge biodiversity of bees that that are in our country. When it comes to honeybees and bumblebees, um, most honeybees are domesticated for the use of honey, whereas bumblebees are all wild species. There's 18 social species and six cuckoo species of bumblebees. Within honeybees, there's only one species in Europe. You get a lot lower numbers of workers in bumblebees with 50 to 400 workers, whereas honeybees have 50,000 workers. This can mean that they both compete for flowers because they have different numbers of workers. During the annual cycle of bumblebees, only the queens survive over winter, whereas because the colonies have, because honeybees have a hive, the whole colony survives over winter. Bumblebees are actually really struggling, especially due to habitat loss, and honeybees are badly affected by diseases. Solitary bees, there are a huge number of them, over 250 species. They're not social insects. Instead, the female provisions nests on her own, but they often do nest in aggregation, so they nest in groups, but not together. So there are three main groups of solitary bees. There's bees nesting underground. There's kleptoparasitic bees, which pa parasitize other bees, and bees that nest in crevices, dead wood, and walls. You can see the picture below here. You can see that a solitary bee is nesting in this hole. So what, she, what she's done is she's gone into the hole, laid her eggs, and then using mud and a bit of wax she's created a seal to seal her eggs in one by one mm, yeah. and bees like red mason bee is quite a common one that does this and on the picture above you can see a bee cutting into a leaf so this is a leaf cutter bee it actually uses its mandibles to cut a circle oh, yeah, out of leaf. 
it's pretty cool. We've got one of these in at our office, nesting in a bee hotel that we have, and it makes its nest out of these leaves. So you get these little pockets filled with eggs, which are very cool. So uh, solitary bees are really the workhorses of the fruit orchards. They they do most of the pollination of fruit. They also have hairs on their abdomen, their belly, their abdomen, which collects a lot of pollen because it's so hairy. And then as they're flying, as they're moving to flowers, the pollen comes off quite easily. So they're extremely efficient pollinators. They're actually 120 times more effective than honeybees at pollination, which is quite a remarkable figure. Bumblebees as well are uh, really important pollinators. Their tongues are different lengths, so they can pollinate a range of different flowers. So some bees are especially adapted to long, having long tongues and going into tubular plants. Uh, they're actually eight times more efficient than honeybees at pollination. Most species are social. They have a queen, work, female workers and males. They forage one to three kilometers from the nest and they have dense hairy bodies with colored bands on. <coughs> they're also cold blooded. They're like other insects, they need to warm their body up. And in order to fly, they need to reach 30 degrees. So they have, they really need quite a lot of energy, which means that they need a lot of flowers. They need a lot of nectar and pollen in order to, to produce energy to warm up to fly. Uh, here's the life cycle of a bumblebee. What happens is in spring, the hibernating queen detects the warmer temperature and starts to waken up and she goes out of where she's been hibernating and looks for pollen and makes a new nest. She lays her first brood and collects pollen and nectar to feed the brood and she keeps the eggs warm by sitting on the eggs and vibrating her body. The larvae emerges after a few days and then the larvae grow for a few weeks. Then they spin cocoons and become fully grown workers after four to five weeks. In summer, the first group are, are, are all female workers. Some stay to guard and clean the nest. Some for, forage for nectar and pollen to feed other, work out, to feed other workers but the queen stays in the nest laying more and more eggs. By late summer, it gets really interesting because the queen uses a chemical signal to change the nest. So she lays unfertilized eggs, which develop into males. And then she feeds the female eggs with more food, which is a chemical signal to turn into a queen. Then the males leave and spend all their time mating. As you can see in this picture, the new queens leave the nest and mate with the males, but it's often a fight between the males to get a mate. So not all males get to mate. But once the queen is mated, she feeds to, to store energy up for hibernation. And then the old nest comes to an end by autumn. So that means that the workers and the males reach the end of their life cycle. And the new queen survives by hibernation over winter. Unfortunately, bumblebees are in trouble because they rely on, on habitat. They rely on flowery habitat in order to survive. And we've lost 97% of our wildflowers since the 1930s. Bumblebees need to forage for food from March to October. So they need to have flowering plants early on until later in the year. So earlier on, dandelions are an absolute lifesaver for bumblebees. They increase the likelihood of survival for a queen bumblebee by four times. And then plants like ivy in late in October are really great at extending the flowering season for bumblebees. And mm -hmm. bumblebees are vulnerable because they only store about a spoonful of honey in the nest for their larvae. So they don't store loads of honey like uh, honeybees do so they're quite vulnerable to running out of food so because of this 
up to 75% of colonies fail to produce queens. So, and the availability of food is the major factor in this. So we're moving on to act the actual bumblebee identification. And the best way to approach this is to first learn the anatomy of a bee. So what you have first is the head or the face. And the head has a mouth part and two antennae. They have five eyes, which is pretty amazing. Bees have five eyes, two for ultraviolet, blue and green light. And they have three oscilli, which detect changes in light. This means that they can forage at twilight when there's no landmarks visible. They also have a tongue to suck up nectar. They can smell and taste, but they have no ears. But what they can do is feel vibrations and sounds through wood and other sur surfaces. Uh, they also have antennae for touching. I'll show you the antennae there. Uh, then this part of the bee is called the thorax. The thorax contains the wings, which are attached by a row of hooks called hamuli. And the wings beat from 130 to 240 beats per second. So you can see why they need a lot of energy in order to fly. And the legs, the legs down here, have, have combs and brushes which gather pollen in a basket, which is which is pretty amazing. And I've seen the colour of these pollen baskets change depending on what flower they've been feeding on. I've seen purpley ones and ready pollen baskets. And then next up you have the abdomen here. And on the abdomen, you often have a sting if it's a female or a queen but a male doesn't actually have a stinger at all. Mm -hmm. So moving on, when we're, you're identifying bumblebees, there are a few insects which might catch you out that look a bit similar, but don't worry, because we'll go through them. There's Foliucella bombylans, which is a hoverfly and looks very much like a bee but you can tell it's not a bumblebee as it's only got one pair of wings. If you were to see two pairs of wings, then you'd automatically know it's a bee. Then moving on to the honeybee, you can see its abdomen is, is highly banded. It's got a lot of black bands on. It's not as bulbous as a bumblebee, and so it's quite different. Then finally, you have the hairy-footed flower bee, which is quite small and all black all over. Bumblebees often have banding or a ginger cover, not, they're not black all over. So moving on, the first step that you take when you're identifying bumblebees is to look at the color of the tail, the tail on the abdomen. So there's three groups, you get white-tailed bumblebees, you get red-tailed bumblebees, and you get uniformly tailed Colored, uniformly colored tail bumblebees, where the tail is the same color as the abdomen. So the second step is to look at the banding of a bumblebee, especially for white-tailed species, as they vary from one to three yellow bands, depending on the species. So on the left here, you can see this species only has two bands, and it's a buff tail bumblebee, but on the right, this species has oh, this species has three bands, but this is a garden. This the three bands make this a garden bumblebee. You can see that the band on the thorax almost looks like it's joined to the one on the abdomen, but that makes it separate because one is on the two two are on the thorax and one is on the abdomen. The next step is the have a think is it a true or is it a cuckoo species there are six bees which are parasitic in the nest of common bumblebees and cuckoo bumblebees have very hairy legs they don't actually have any pollen baskets and they don't they have dark wing membranes short faces and a small brush of black hairs at the end of the abdomen here's a picture of one this is bombus campestris 
the they're parasitic, so the females kill or evict the queen and take over her workers as their own and use them to rear their own offspring. Next stop when you're identifying bumblebees is to try and work out whether it's a queen, a female worker or a male. Queen and workers are generally very similar to each other, the queens being a lot bigger, except in early bumblebees, which lose the yellow abdominal band of the queen. So this, this early bumblebee on the left here, you see it has a yellow band on the abdomen, whereas the bumblebee on the right, which is a worker, not, or not the one on the left is a queen, has lost that yellow band on the abdomen. Now to tell the difference between a male and a female, um, you'll find that male bumblebees have very ha hairy hind legs and they don't have a pollen basket. That's a big giveaway. If they don't have a pollen basket, then it's, it's probably a male. And males, males also have facial hair. So males have hairy legs, a moustache, and look slightly unkempt. <laughs> Good like that. And you can also tell a difference between males and females by their behaviour. Males sit lazily on flowers and fly along hedgerows looking for a mate, whereas the females are busy collecting nectar and pollen for the nest, quickly going from flower to flower, okay. or, or protecting the nest. And males become much more common in late summer, autumn, so you're more likely in early spring to find the queen and the workers. So moving on, there are nine bumblebees that you may nine common and on, nine bumblebees that you may see in Cumbria. So first, so the white tail species. Mm -hmm. So these two species at the top, these all have all of these bees have white tails, but the two species at the top has only two bands, one on the thorax and one on the abdomen. The two at the bottom have three bands, two on the thorax and one on the abdomen. So the two on the top, the buff-tailed bumblebee and the white-tailed bumblebee, you can tell the difference because on the bumble buff-tailed bumblebee, if I wiggle my um, mouse, you can see where the white on the tail meets the black on the tail, there's a yellow fringe. And that means it's definitely a buff-tailed bumblebee. And if it has two stripes and no yellow fringe that means that it's definitely going to be a white-tailed bumblebee down at the bottom where we have the garden bumblebee which has three bands the heath bumblebee also has three bands but the garden bumblebee has a much longer face and the heath bumblebee has a much more round face also the garden bumblebee has a very long tongue and it likes tubular plants like honeysuckle and and foxglove and the two bumblebees at the top are very common and so is the garden bumblebee that's very common you'll often see that last of the white-tailed bumblebees that you're likely to see in Cumbria is the tree bumblebee so they have a ginger thorax and white tail in the abdomen this is a real success story because they came, they migrated in from France and they don't seem to have any negative effect on other bumblebees, but they've been moving northwards up England and into Scotland. Um, so they've done really well here. Next up, we have the bilberry bumblebee and the early bumblebee. They both have two yellow bands, but the bilberry bumblebee, which ha has a red tail that goes halfway up to three quarters of the tail, whereas the early bumblebee only has a small tip of red on the end. We're really lucky to have the bilberry bumblebee here in abundance on the heathlands um, here in Cumbria. What they like to feed on is heath and bilberry, and then when they've done feeding on them, they do come in, down into our gardens. So that's a really beautiful one to keep an eye out for. The early bumblebee is a small bee, 
often it actually often nests in tip boxes and its colony is quite short lived and produces males early in spring. So that's one that you'll see mm. earlier in the year. So mm. The next red tailed bumblebee we have is called the red tailed bumblebee, which is nice and easy to remember. So it has a ready to orange tip on the tail of the bumblebee and a black fox at some black abdomen. You can see this one's got an absolutely huge pollen basket, which is quite amazing. And you can see the pollen on the legs as well, the legs for what? The red-tailed bumblebee is common in gardens and many habitats, and they nest underground. And they also really like yellow flowers, especially bird's foot treffle. They are usually the latest flying bumblebees as well. So the last one that's quite common that you'll see in Cumbria is called common card bumblebee. I like to call this the teddy bear because it's gingery brown all over. It's quite an easy one to, to identify. You can see the pollen all over this one as well. Um, it's very abundant and it's a regular garden species. Its range is expanding and it actually collects moss to build the cover of its nest. And it likes to visit dead nettles, legumes, and it likes foxglove as well. So what we'd absolutely love you to do is to go out and start identifying bumblebees and other pollinators. Lockdown might have given us more, more time than ever before to do this, which is great. Um, so what we've got is a Get Cumbria Buzzing Record the Buzz form. And all you do is you add the species name, whether it's scientific or the common name. Here I've added the buff tail bumblebee. Then you add the grid reference, um, and then you add, you can find a grid reference from a website. Quite easy to do online. Then you put the number numbers that you've seen. So here I saw two. You put whether it's male or female or queen, if you know, and you put what flower it's feeding on and any more comments. Then if you've only got one or two sightings to submit, you can submit information about what you've seen directly to the CBDC website. They've got a form on there, which is really easy to fill out. And CBDC stands for Cumbria Biodiversity Data Center. They're our partner on the recording strand of our project. So, they collate all the records for us and put them onto a map so we can see how pollinators are doing. And if you'd like to submit regular sightings, if you've got loads to submit, which I hope I hope you do, you complete the record form, which I'll send to you at the end of this presentation. If you give me an, uh, an email, I'll give you my email at the end of this presentation. So you submit them either to me or the recording officer at CBDC. Also, we've been using this amazing app called iNaturalist. I don't know if anyone's used it before, but it's excellent because you can upload a photo of a bee, then it'll suggest an ID for it, uh, a name for it. It'll actually try and identify what you've submitted. But then there are experts on the site that will come along and verify where you, whether you've got the right name or suggest a different name. So it's amazing. And what we've done is set up a project within this tab here where my mouse is within projects and it's called get cumbria buzzing and you just join the project and then you go when you add a photo you click on this button here add observations and then you can add a photo to our project so then we can extract all the data and put it on the pollinator map so you can get this either on your laptop by going to this website, or you can download an app to your phone. For, and then we also have a Facebook group where we're sharing knowledge, helping each other out in our ID. Uh, there's quite a few photos on there of people trying to work out what bumblebees they've found. And it's called Record the Buzz Cumbria Pollinator Recording. So please add yourself to that write that down. Next up, I've got a little bit of a quiz for you all. This is what you want to hear, isn't it? 
So <laughs> I'm going to give you two minutes to work out the names of all of these bumblebees. So number them from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, from left to right. So I'll give you two minutes starting from now. Oh, that's the white tail. That's so it's one of six. I'll oh, let garden. you. Bumblebee. Garden bumblebee. I'll let you write it down on a bit of paper in your own time. Then I'll go over the answers. Look at the book. <laughs> <laughs> right there. The garden bumblebee. Yeah, you write the number down. Can you mute everyone? Yeah, I'll just do that now. So remember, I gave extra points if you can guess which are a worker or a queen and which are male. Remember the fact about the pollen basket. One minute left, I'll give you an extra minute and then I'll go through them all. Okay, that's two minutes off. Hope everyone's ready. So the first one has two stripe, two bands, one band on the thorax, one on the abdomen. And looking at the white tail, it actually has very slightly a yellow fringe. Can you see? So this one is a buff tail bumblebee. Next up, we have two bands on the bumblebee and there's no yellow fringe where the white meets the black. So that one is a white tailed bumblebee. And can you see it has a small pollen sac. So this is probably a worker or a queen. Definitely not a male. Bonus points if you got that. Uh, now this one has a red, red tail and a black forex, forex and abdomen which makes it the red tail bumblebee and it's got an absolutely massive pollen basket on it. Uh, next up we have the common card of bumblebee because it's gingery all over. Next up we have the tree bumblebee with ginger thorax and a white tail. Next up we have a white tail and three stripes, three bands, one, two, Free. So that makes it the garden bumblebee. And after that, we have two bands, two yellow bands, and a slight red tail, which makes this bumblebee the early bumblebee. And very last, we have the beautiful bilberry bumblebee, because three quarters of its abdomen is red and two 
band, two yellow bands. So I hope that was fun. I hope you got lots of them right. Next up, this is just really to show our pollinator atlas. We'd really love to get as many sightings of bumblebees and other pollinators as possible so we can start to map them on Cumbria and see, track their movements. But we'd also really love it if you could submit where you're, where you're gardening for pollinators. I'm sure you're doing your little bit for insects and other pollinators. And what we've got on our web page is a map where we're adding everyone's garden to the map to show that we want Northwest Cumbria full of flower rich gardens and green spaces for pollinators. And to find that map, you just go to our Get Cumbria Buzzing webpage and it, it will be on there. You just type in Get Cumbria Buzzing to Google. This talk was free, but if you could donate to help pollinators, your donation would help restore and create diverse habitats for our pollinators. We've got a donate button on our website as well. so. That would be fantastic. And also, really excitingly, we've got Wild Pollinators, A Beginner's Guide to Wild Pollinators in Cumbria. This is a new booklet that we've just produced on wild pollinators, and it's free, available to download on our website. So again, you just type in Get Cumbria Buzzing into Google and go on the first, uh, first search link. And then you just download this from our web page. It's a brilliant book and it's got a lot of information inside it. So that's that's everything from me. If you need, if you would like a B pack and a recording sheet, then just email me at ucg at cumbriawildlifetrust.org.uk. And next up, so we'll just go through a few questions for 10 minutes. And I'll just take a look at my chat bar to see. Can you just say that again? It, it was Lucy G, was it? Oh, I'll see it on the screen. Thank you. Lucy G at CumbriaWildlifeTrust.org.uk. So I'm just going to go to the chat bar to have a look at some questions. Uh, someone's asked if we can have a copy of the PowerPoint. I'm sure we can do that. If you again email me, then I can email that over to you. Any information that's that I'm sure I could email the presentation over to you. Someone's asked if we only want West Cumbria because um, they're in South Cumbria. We want the whole of Cumbria. So wherever you are in Cumbria, um, obviously we want a lot of records from West Cumbria because that's our project area, but we're accepting it from the whole of Cumbria. So someone asked, what's the best time of day, weather conditions to record bumblebees? The best weather is sunny weather, so about midday will be the best weather when the sun is high. They don't really like rain or wind very much. Uh, someone's asked, what is my favourite bee? Oh, I think it has to be the bilberry bumblebee because it's just so beautiful and it's quite rare. but here we've got it in abundance over the heathlands which i think is just amazing i i love the coloring of of the bilberry bumblebee hello there uh, can you recommend the um the most appropriate or list of uh, plants uh, that are most bee friendly to plant in a garden or is that included in the bee pack it's not included in the B pack, but I can send something over that has right, that in it as well. I'll put in, a request, I'll put in a request now. Thank you very okay. much indeed. Plants like Vipers Bugloss and Meadow Cranes Bill, I've seen absolutely buzzing with bumblebees at the moment. And in terms of flowers, it's really important to have dandelions really because uh, they flower really early on and they're a lifeline for bumblebees. And then later in autumn, it's great to have ivy growing because they're lifeline later on in the bumblebee's life. Uh, let's have a look at some more questions. I can't get the chat. Can I ask you a live question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it's not really a question. It's just something I've noticed. 
I've got a lot of winter flowering heather and that's in my garden. That's the first thing that gets covered in the bees, you know, oh, from beautiful. quite early on, February and March, you know, out then. Sort of a good thing to have. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's great to have. Thank you for sharing. Uh, someone said, can you put this today's session on YouTube and email participants when it's done? Yeah, I can do that. So I'll, um, I've recorded this presentation, so it'll go on YouTube after today. Okay, some more questions. Someone asked, is it true that male bees die after mating? Uh, males don't live that long. Their main role in life is to find a mate, but I don't, don't think that they die straight away after mating. Uh, let's go to the top. Uh, let's see. Someone's asked for their bee hotel, what size should I make for solitary bees? I'd say just doing a range of sizes. Uh, different solitary bees prefer a different size hole. And if you Google it, um, they'll give you more accurately sized holes if you are wanting to attract particular bees. Like I know leaf cutter bees like a specific diameter, but it's best to, to Google for these measurements. Just seeing if there's any more. So someone's asked, what is our most common bumblebee? Well, that will be the uh, white-tailed and, well, buff-tailed is probably our most common bumblebee, but also common are white-tails, red-tails, common garden bumblebees, uh, and garden bumblebees. So those six really are our most common bumblebees. Someone's also asked, what is the most common bumblebee going in and out of my brick wall? The most common, common solitary bee would be the red mason bee. It likes south to southwest. But the most common bumblebee will probably be the tree bumblebee. Uh, Just looking for some more questions. So why does a female have a sting and not a male? That's because the female it is often looking after the nest and is doing most of the work. So it's trying to protect the nest, whereas the male's main purpose is to mate. So that's why the female has sting, as its main role is to look after the nest. Next one is, why are you restoring habitat along roads? Won't uh, pollinators get killed? Can I ask Tanya, uh, project manager, to answer that question? Tanya, would you be able to answer that one? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah great, yeah. Yeah, well, that's a, a good question. So a lot of people do ask what you know why are you doing restoration work on verges um but if you remember lucy's slide about the bee line and the actual habitat corridor that's been mapped by bug life and that corridor is a, a quite an important routeway for our pollinators because it falls between our our mountainous regions in cumbria um, and it's the main valley routeway, if you like. So that ecologically has been mapped as a, a best fit routeway. The fact that our strategic road network actually coincides with that, well, you know, this is something that we, you know, we increasingly are getting issues with about sharing our space with nature. So um, creating habitat is really important. And this habitat that we're creating along the verges is linear. So a lot of the movement we want is along the side of the verges as opposed to across the actual road um, and yes there will be fatalities of course uh, bees will collide with cars but actually putting the habitat there or restoring the habitat 
is far greater really than the losses of the the bees um there's been quite a few studies in this uh of this um and we can do it as sensitively as possible we can do a lot of off network restoration on our verges so that's what we consider when we do a habitat restoration um, and we keep abreast of um all the local i said the current um thinking in in terms of verge restoration um, but the current thinking is that it's a good thing and it builds a habitat that we have. Is thank that all right? Jack. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, another one about the A66. Will this be affected by roadworks planned? That's... Uh, well, we've good question again. Um, we have worked very hard um, with, or very closely, should I say, with Highways England um, and you know, we've sensitively selected verges that haven't got uh, any works on. Um, and these, you know, th these are covered with a sort of 10 year plan. Um, but there are new works going on the other side of the A66 where our project isn't. Um, but obviously the uh, where we've done a restoration work, uh, we've aimed so it won't be affected by any future works. Brilliant, thank you. Okay. Um, someone asked if we record on iNaturalist, should we record with CBDC as well? You only need to record through one medium. So if you're recording on iNaturalist, stick to iNaturalist. But if you'd like to record with CBDC, then just um, record with CBDC. So one or the other is one or the other is best, so they don't get double um, sighting. Um, there's quite a few questions, but I think we're coming to our 10 minutes. I'll pick out a couple more. Uh, okay. I'll just pick out one more. On the slide, the nests appear to be on the ground. Is it common for bees to nest on the ground? Bumble, with bumblebees, it's really common for them to nest on the ground. They actually like to nest in, in mouse holes because they know, because they can't really make a nest themselves. They rely on the nesting material to be there. So they really like nesting in mouse holes. So that's everything. For, I think that's all the questions we'll get through today. Um, if you've got any more questions that you'd really like to ask, please email me and email me if you'd like a B pack and a recording sheet. And um, I'm sure I'll be able to send you the presentation as well. So that's all from us today. I hope you had you've enjoyed the presentation. Um, please, it'd be great if you could leave us feedback in the chat. If you've got any feedback about things that went well or things that can be improved, um, looking to improve and do more of these so yeah we would love your we would absolutely love your feedback